Hello and welcome to a bonus episode of Statistically Insignificant. I am your Tess for today. My pronouns are she and they, and with me is Bart. How's it going? I'm good. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. And uh, yeah, since we're on this side of the paywall, I thought I might drop like a cancelable opinion. Okay. So uh, Machine Gun Kelly's pop punk albums are very fun to listen to. <laughs> I have never heard them, unfortunately. <laughs> is this one of those things where Machine Gun Kelly has turned out to be just an awful person? Uh, I just think everyone hates him, and for good reason. He seems like a wanker, but... Oh, fair enough. Yep, yep. <laughs> I, um, look, I can't point any fingers in that regard, so, you know. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> This episode is going to be a whole bunch of different topics about teaching maths and stats. I have um, many opinions on it, not least because I do actually teach, but because I have had some experience with having a bad time in math. My hope is that for people learning maths and stats, this can provide a really useful perspective for how teachers think about it, and also how that like experience of like learning maths badly contrasts to the like good experience of learning maths really well later on. So my maths in high school was pretty crap. Uh, I had a teacher who hated me in about year eight, which was 13-ish, oh, I think. So I fell behind around about then, which made the rest of it really, really difficult. I also just wasn't in a good headspace in high school, and frankly, it's amazing I got as good marks as I did in the end. I did the core senior maths course, which had basic calculus in it, and failed at least one of the exams related to that. In particular, I had really crippling anxiety around the fact that I couldn't do a lot of the maths, which made learning maths even harder. I distinctly remember my father trying to help me with calculus at home. He was not a great person to have teaching me, because while he knew the content, I was absolutely terrified of my parents finding out how little I knew. So I basically <laughs> sat at the kitchen table, desperately trying not to have a panic attack and cry while he tried to walk me through those problems. Lucky for me, by the time I came back to doing maths at university, I'd been through the near lethal trial of my first degree, developed a work ethic around study, and was actually prepared to learn it properly. So the first thing I want to talk about is maths anxiety. There's a lot of literature these days about maths anxiety in adults and kids, and particularly in like the teaching pedagogy material. I think that it comes in two forms. People who have anxiety around maths because they've had a bad time with it and think that they're not a maths person as a result. And people who feel like they should be able to do maths because they're smart, but there are gaps in their knowledge, so it's really hard and thus winds up being a huge threat to their self-image. So I grew up being told I was a gifted child for many, many years. You can imagine which of these I fell into. <laughs> I think I was the first one, to be honest. Yeah. Although I did have a bit of that gifted child shit. Oh, I God. I, <laughs> it's funny how much damage that has done to a lot of people that I know. Because well, I think it's because our models for what that looks like, for what gifted and talented means is that things should be effortless. Because realistically, that's a, what a lot of people experienced. Like, going through high school and things where most, or even primary school, where things just aren't challenging. So in your head, and certainly in my head, my idea of what it meant for me to be smart was that things would always be easy. This does not work. <laughs> 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 it does not work in maths. It did not work in my arts degree, which is one of the reasons it nearly killed me. And, like, all of that sort of thing builds into this kind of anxiety around it. I think that the first group are generally easier to help because it's often possible to introduce them to forms of maths which don't look like what they're used to. Like, we can talk about ideas around quantifying things or mathematical objects without setting someone down and forcing them to do an arithmetic problem. A vibes-based pedagogy, if you will. <laughs> I generally find it's more productive to do that with people who are not a maths person. It also helps to say to those people that yes, the maths is hard, but practice and making mistakes and learning from mistakes really does make, have an impact to make things get easy with time. The second group are harder because their self-esteem is bound up in their inability to do it. So failing to do something or making mistakes is quite emotionally devastating. That's usually a hurdle in other parts of their lives too, so perfectionism, anxiety, and self-esteem are all bound up into a very difficult mess. There's a lot else going on, and the best way to help people in that situation is generally to give them, aside from like the psychological support that they need, situations where failure has no stakes. Create an environment in 
really outside of the classroom, it's easy to do this, in, but in the classroom as well, when not knowing something or making a mistake just aren't an issue. This gets really hard to deal with when it comes to assessment, because things like assessments, and particularly exams, when there's time pressure and you don't have the opportunity to make corrections, have high stakes. And one of the things that has given me like endless anxiety as when I was doing coursework, well, okay, it did end in the sense that I stopped doing coursework, <laughs> but like assignments and exams where I couldn't review and do corrections or I had this like time pressure and deadlines and everything was really, really bad for my mental health because like even if I put a lot of work into things, I wouldn't get everything correct. And I often like losing marks to silly mistakes is so frustrating. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, for me, I learned most of those coping mechanisms from playing Dark Souls, which taught me more about applying myself to learning something than high school did. (laughs) This leads me to the second topic. There are no useless questions. This is really hard for your type 2 anxious person because they don't want to reveal that they don't know something. But for type 1 anxious people, it can be a barrier too because sometimes they feel like they are wasting my time if they don't know something. This is not just a salve for the egos of my students. It's a statement of teaching practice. Teaching maths and stats and teaching anything is a collaboration between me and my students. And if there is a gap in their knowledge, them asking questions is a matter of troubleshooting those gaps. They're very difficult to detect if someone just sits in silence and then fails to answer the questions on exam. I would like to add that there should be a special hell filled with really shit marking for teachers who belittle students for not knowing things. Fuck those people. (laughs) How the questions are asked can be very revealing because it's possible to spot misconceptions or or missing information if the way that they ask doesn't quite represent understanding of notation is a big one. But like there's some concept that they that they don't get will inform how they ask the question. If they haven't understood something in my teaching, I need to adapt it to them. If the problem is that they don't have some background knowledge which is assumed, that's particularly important to address because chances are that will affect more than the current topic too. Because maths and stats are hierarchically structured. This is also called vertical structuring, uh, depending on which body of theory you're looking at. What I mean by this is you have to understand some fundamentals before you can go on to other things because they form basic tools used in more advanced settings. If you struggle with arithmetic, algebra will be very difficult for you. Algebra itself, the abstraction of representing things with variables such as y is equal to x squared, where this describes a relationship between inputs x and outputs y. Mm -hmm. This is a major stumbling block for people when they first get to it. I don't teach in high schools, but I would bet money that for an awful lot of students, if they aren't given the time and support to understand this kind of abstraction, that becomes the main barrier to maths for the rest of their schooling and potentially for the rest of their lives. I think that this is a major source of that type 1 maths anxiety. People come to think of themselves as not maths people and become fearful of it because they see something like this and it just makes them freeze up because they never got to that level of like abstraction. So there's kind of no way around rote learning in this model? This is not really about rote learning because like as a relationship, you can't sit there and memorize every number for which y is equal to x squared because there's infinitely many of them. What needs to happen in, in, in particularly in the case of like this sort of algebraic representation is people just need to be exposed enough to the fact that this is about describing a relationship. You can put whatever number you like in here and you will get something out at the other side. Yeah. That is very, very different to like having concrete examples. And like, I think the rote learning side of things comes in when you look at a whole bunch of examples perhaps, and then you can say, okay, all of these examples are cases of this overall relationship so like let's oh let's see if i can come up with you so x is equal to two y is equal to four uh x three i'm just going through the square numbers in my head y equal to nine and so on so i can just think of a number multiply it by itself and that will give you a y yeah but that underlying relationship as expressed here doesn't care what number you put in at the start yeah 
The hierarchical structure also makes how we teach maths in schools, even in uni, very, very difficult because there's a lot of content, it moves very fast, and there's vanishingly little support for people who fall behind. In schools in particular, if you have huge classes and an an hour-long lesson, you just don't have the time to help the people who are struggling. And they're going to struggle even more with the next thing as a result. This is why algebra is such a huge stumbling block, because basically from that point on, most of the stuff you are looking at will be expressed algebraically in some form or another. You might not use X and Y, but you will generally use some sort of variable name. Let's change tack slightly to more of the actual content of maths teaching than the meta structure, which is what I think this is. One of the difficult things to teach in maths is both that it's a set of ideas and a way of expressing them, which is mathematical language. This is hard for people just starting out because the notation is difficult, and a lot of the time it's just not taught as a language. I have quite distinct and very bitter memories of being required to write gibberish in schools in mathematical symbols because that's what the markers demanded, and I would lose marks for writing words. I mean gibberish quite literally, quite literally, because there was no way to translate what was being written into a sentence where some symbols were mathematical notation. People who learn this way in high school, and for example, hate writing essays in English, wind up being math students at uni who really struggle with suddenly needing to write things in coherent language. Yeah. Let's have a look at an example, and also to show how information dense the notation is. Let f be a function such that f maps from the real numbers to the real numbers, which means that f takes as input some number and gives as output some other number, and f applied to a number, so f of x, is equal to 3x squared plus 1. This is a sentence. Perfectly clear. Yeah, right? (laughs) God help you if you see this in high school. (laughs) Right? But this is how math should be expressed. The notation here also makes it way shorter than it otherwise would be, because like you can imagine writing every single those every single one of those like words out three times as long. One of the major advancements in maths during the 18th and 19th century was developing this sort of notation. Uh, this is particularly true when it comes to things like geometry. Old maths can be very very difficult to read because it's not notation like this. This is also much more information dense as a result of like condensing those words into the symbols, which can make it very difficult to get into when you're first learning. Another critical feature of communicating maths is what linguists call the mode, the form that the communication takes. Different, of course, to how we use mode in stats. This podcast is multimodal. For the listener, it has audio, video, text, and images for you, but it's also responsive to questions. And that is like a critical difference between what happens to a listener and what happens to a co-host. In both these cases, time plays a really critical part when I introduce equations or do calculations in particular. That's very deliberate because dumping an equation on someone can be very hard to interpret. And it's one of the reasons that learning maths from textbooks or lecture slides is really hard. So I'm going to inflict an example on you, Bart. All right. Would you like to have a go? Take random samples X1, I... We calculate. <laughs> yeah, right? It's a wall. <laughs> is that the square root symbol? Yeah. So this is <laughs> this is a square root symbol. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is a wall. If you see this on a page, you just kind of, I mean, even I, who have had like years and years of training, go, oh, fuck, I guess we're going to have to work through this. But it becomes much more comprehensible if you walk through it with time and do, doing it as language. So let's do that. I'm going to do write exactly the same thing. Take random samples x i from i equals one up to n x and y i from i equals one up to n y. We calculate. So we're going to call the output t. And it is equal to a fraction. So I'm going to write the big line for the fraction. So on the top is x bar minus y bar. So I'll get to this in a second after I've written this 
I'll get to this in a second where I'm going to like say what each of these symbols mean. But these yep. are sample means. And on the bottom is a square root. And it is the square root of nx minus 1 times s square, x squared, which is the sample variance, plus ny minus 1 times sy squared, divided by nx plus ny minus 2. And that is multiplied by, within the square root, 1 on nx plus 1 on ny. Got to be honest, I'm still confused. Yep, but <laughs> it's a little bit more comprehensible, right? It's not... You can see where the symbols relate to each other. Yeah. This is where an x is the sample size for x, and y is the sample size for y, x bar is the sample mean for those x's, y bar is the sample mean for y, S squared X is the sample variance for X. S squared Y is the sample variance for Y. Now, one of the things that going through this in time does is it tells you which of the symbols in this mess are like whole symbols as opposed to like different pieces. So this S squared X is a whole symbol. It represents an entire thing, whereas yeah. one is also an entire thing. And this is one of the reasons that like subscripts and superscripts play, play such an important role in maths is because they give you additional inf information about what is a like complete mathematical symbol just comprised of different parts. Yep. All right. <laughs> that was indeed a bit of a wall. But you can also imagine like having to write out what I said as I was doing this formula as a paragraph, yeah. several paragraphs probably, right? To demonstrate the information density, I I'm going to read yeah. this again. X bar minus Y bar divided by the square root of, oh God, uh, NX minus one times the variance of, sample variance of X plus NY minus one times the sample variance of Y, that is divided by NX plus NY minus two. All of that is still multiplied by one on NX plus one on NY. It's a lot. <laughs> So, what what I I don't understand the takeaway one and takeaway two in various positions. Are they like? Um... Oh, okay. So this is um this is done for stats reasons. I guess is the yeah. the easiest way to say that. <laughs> yeah, it, you can just treat it as a bunch of different arithmetic operations that are being done. Sure. Yep. One of the advantages to the mathematical notation, once you get used to it, is that it does allow you to represent things in, in a visual way that you can't really do with like a sequence of language. For example, the fact that I have this division here is much easier to express visually because I can just say this bit's on the top and the rest of this is all on the bottom. Whereas if I put that in a linear sequence, it's hard. The other thing that's really hard to express is where these parentheses go because like nx minus one times sx squared, so that's this bit in here, it's very hard to, in that sentence, work out where the parentheses are around nx minus one because yeah. they just don't fall into the language that easily. So um, this is me remembering an old episode. Yep. There was a period of human history where mathematics was done without the operation symbols at all. It was all done in kind of the textual way. Yeah. Yeah. And it was hard, <laughs> even yeah. harder than it is now. <laughs> so one of the... Um, Interesting things I think about the, the history of maths language and the history of maths notation is that once you are able to express things in this much denser way, suddenly the things that you can deal with become more complex. Yeah. Once you understand the properties of something you've bound up in this notation, you can deal with it just as an object in a way that you couldn't previously. Oh, and I even ma imagine like um, before the Arabic number system was introduced, it must have been more difficult just because you don't have a, um, it, it's uh, much more complicated to be calculating around 12 than it is around 10, if you know what I mean. In um, so Arabic was not the oldest way of expressing numbers. Like the, um, so the Arabic number system that we have was like formalized during the um, Islamic Golden Age. And in fact, there are ways of writing maths operations in language, 
like like mathematical not- notation, sorry, in Arabic, which differ from how we write them in English. For example, yeah. uh, this is typically read left to right, whereas Arabic you read right to left. So there are there are those sorts of differences. But I mean, even much earlier scripts like had some form of numerals. They just were not necessarily. Um, it was just like there were a lot of them, as opposed to what is nowadays pretty like globally consistent language, and yeah. um, the stuff like math- mathematical operations were not as robustly defined. Sure. Yeah. This is actually one of the ways that suddenly going to remote teaching during COVID really fucked up math subjects. Lectures that were previously done in person on blackboards or whiteboards written much like this were suddenly being done online, and a lot of the teaching staff were just not given the resources or support to make that transition well. So a lot of people were stuck doing slideshows over Zoom because they didn't have access to the equipment or training to do better. So this setup that I have, which is a Wacom tablet, screen recording software, audio recording software, a studio microphone, because God help me, I hate listening to bad recordings. It just makes it unintelligible. (laughs) This costs about, what, like $800 to set up. I also have a lot of practice doing this. I have a fair amount of practice working with this software. No university gave me the support for that. And as, as I have complained about in the various episodes we've done talking about teaching conditions, that just isn't available. I mean, at best, you might have been, like, if if you were a full-time staff member, you were probably given a computer during your employment. Not if you're casual. And teaching really suffers as a result. That makes sense. Yeah, it's pretty bad. The last thing I want to talk about today is a bit of philosophical whining. This relates to teaching because understanding how maths works as a field of study really helps students understand what they're doing when they prove things or when they talk about mathematical objects, which is that maths is not a science. We're talking both ontologically, what math studies are not objects that exist in the real world, and epistemologically, how we know things in maths is radically different to the sciences. I want to focus on the epistemology, how we know things, what what makes something knowledge in maths. We've talked before about science as a system, system of trying to find the best explanation of evidence. This is also called like empiricism or whatever else. It can be observational evidence. It can be experimental evidence. This is why I say that sociology is closer to physics than physics is to maths, because physics is about the real world. However, the underlying structure in maths and stats as a field of applied maths is not evidence-based. You can really prove that something is true in maths, which you can't do in science, because all you can say is, well, our explanation is better based on whatever. We call this deductive logic. Oh, like Sherlock Holmes. (laughs) Fuck that guy. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, he did not have very good explanations of evidence outside of the contrivances of the author. (laughs) I love those books. (laughs) You nerd. (laughs) So a theorem and a proof of that theorem is a basic unit of knowledge in maths. How they work is that you have some set of conditions, and if those conditions are met, then the result is necessarily true. A proof is a logical argument which shows that this relationship holds. If you ever do logic, the actual term for this is that it is a valid argument, which means an argument in logic or maths or whatever else is considered valid if um, this is if this holds, right? If the conditions are met, then the outcome must be true. That makes something a valid argument. I mean, this argu- arguably, uh, this also holds in rhetoric, but rhetoric is much more about the feelings and the vibe of what you're saying than it is actually about the content. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. I'm going to do one that's relatively straightforward and one that's a bit more abstract. So the first one is called the pigeonhole principle. So the conditions are if we have n, which is some number, boxes, and more than n objects, then at least one box will have more than one object in it. Uh, Assuming you are filling the boxes with the objects anyway. All right, let's prove this. So you take n boxes and n plus m, whoop, that's really weird m, objects. 
this is some number m, which just means that you have a bigger number of objects than you do boxes, right? Yep. Fill the n boxes with one object each, leaving n plus m minus n, which is m objects left. Yeah. These have to go somewhere. So we'll increase the number of objects I'm running out of space, sorry, in at least one box. beyond one. And then we put a little square at the end that we call a tombstone, which represents quad error demonstrandum, or and so it has been shown, which basically means right. that this is the end of the proof. So what's the logic here? I have n boxes, I have more than that objects. If I put one object in each box, I still have leftover that has to go somewhere. Yeah, That's a valid argument that constitutes a proof. Which means that if the conditions are met, if you ever have n of like n boxes, n plus one or n plus however many objects, you're going to have more than one thing in one of those boxes at least. There's a more general form of this, but this is also generalizable to things that are not boxes, or shall we say, are metaphorically boxes, yeah, <laughs> and <laughs> metaphorical objects, right? But that's a relatively intuitive thing. It's considered a mathematical construction because we're dealing with numbers of things and we have mathematical ways of representing those. Now I'm going to do something a little bit more abstract. This one's going to be a bit more algebraic. So the statement. Let X and Y be real numbers. Then. All right. So, x plus y times x minus y, there's an invisible little multiplication here between the parentheses, is equal to x squared minus y squared. Let's prove it. We start by expanding brackets. So we're going to expand the first brackets first, so x plus y times x minus y becomes x times x minus y plus y times y minus y minus y x minus y. We can do that again. So we uh, basically expand the second bracket and we get x squared minus x y. So that's what we get from multiplying x by x and x yep. by minus y plus x sorry y x the order matters here for a second, uh, minus y squared. We then exploit that x, y is equal to y, x. So what this means is multiplication is commutative on numbers. It's a technical property. What it means in practice is that it doesn't matter what order you multiply things in. This also means that these two are going to cancel. So this gives us x squared minus xy plus xy, because this is equal to xy minus y squared. These two cancel. This gives us x squared minus y squared as we need it. Yeah. And we put the tombstone over here. So the conditions in this case is that you have two numbers. The consequence is that the product of their sum and difference is the difference of the squares. This is always yeah. true for any number x and y. So we have here described a relationship between numbers and we've yes. presented a valid proof because the only like the only thing we really need to know here is arithmetic operations and that we have this commutative property for multiplication. Will you say that um, that rhetoric doesn't um, isn't the same because it uh, it is more concerned with like feelings and what it's being instilled? But I dis 
I don't disagree. But, um, <laughs> I said more like concerned, not level. unconcerned with the actual truth. But <laughs> with things like um, determining whether something is in the passive or um, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you mean like... Uh, the, the passive voice. Um, you Yeah, you have to run similar kind of operations on the wording of things and where the emphasis lays and that kind of thing. Yeah, so th- I, that sort of... the proof in that way. Well, that's sort of like... I would call that linguistics, right? So that's basically syntax and semantics yeah. and linguistics. So um, where that becomes an argument from evidence is you have a theory, or a scientific theory, about what the syntactic structure of your language is. Yeah. So that is your best explanation of the evidence of how language works for that particular language. And that's where that sort of, like, evidence-based thing comes into play. Yeah. And, like... So when I did linguistics, I did a bunch of like the kind of generative grammar, which is Noam Chomsky's do, and some of the functional grammar, which is a um, different body of theory. I, I I prefer it because I think it is it is better able to deal with natural language, and there are some real weird things going on in Noam Chomsky's um, research. Uh, well, yeah, he at the time he used to say that it was meant to find a mathematical model for. Li- language, um, language and yeah. computing, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, the idea he doesn't of... say that so much anymore because it's kind of been disproven. But yeah, well, that was the <laughs> yeah. So what what he was kind of it was a really really important theoretical step, which was to say that you can have you can use like somebody's expertise in their own language to work out what the rules are for syntax in that language. So that's kind of fundamental idea. And then you can use that syntax to generate, hence generative grammar, sentences that will be grammatical. The problem is that how people actually speak constantly and eternally breaks the rules of grammar, just all the time. But people can still understand what it means. It's just that it's not so like straightforward as the actual rules. So the the founding, well, I guess the functional bit of the functional grammar and the functional linguistics is that you start with how people actually use language. So you don't start by going around and saying, okay, is this sentence grammatical to a whole bunch of like experts that is native speakers? You start by seeing how they talk, looking at the texts they produce and using that to construct your understanding of their grammar. Because generative grammar cannot handle natural language, (laughs) which is one of the real like (laughs) failings of it as a body of theory oh, sorry that was a slight, <laughs> slight aside i will say <laughs> that when it comes to something like mathematical proof the linguistics of maths is not very well developed um, because it's really really hard because it's extremely information dense i know um a guy who was actually my linguistics tutor back when i was studying it who has gone on to do a bunch of research in like functional grammar and things like that looking at how like physics textbooks work because he has somewhat of a physics background. But to do the same with maths is really, really difficult because you have to be able to read all of the notation. You have to basically know the maths in order to do this. And that makes it harder because you have to be a mathematician as well as a linguist. Oh, fun. Yeah. Look, it's not outside the realm of possibility that at some point I will twist his arm and go, let's just write this paper. (laughs) (laughs) Because I have have talked to him occasionally outside of, um, well, since I graduated. And I reckon yeah. that at some point I would quite like to do a paper looking at the actual language of maths because it is so interesting and it is so important. But fuck, it's going to be hard. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. All right. That's all I've got for today. But thank you so much for listening to me ramble. As ever. Thank you for rambling. <laughs> and I am sure I'll have more to say on teaching maths in the future at some point. Absolutely. See you next time. See you then.